All right. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Lokesh from the Soul Freedom Show, and we have two amazing guests today, Daitina and David. And Daitina actually is kind of, is also a co-host for me, so she's also a guest and a co-host, but we're both going to be interviewing David. Hi, David. Hi, Daitina. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> How's the day going for you guys? Uh, it's going fantastic as a band of elastic. Um, it's beautiful. I live in the SF Bay Area and went for an incredible morning hike talking about um, the alchemy of spirituality and spiritual tech uh, with a friend who is clairaudient. So he was telling me how he guides his acupuncturist based on the sound um, of the needles going into him, like the clairaudient sound. So he says that when the needles reach the right depth, he hears a certain pitch and his acupuncturist is like, I've never heard that before. And it's so interesting being a clairvoyant, getting images of like thumbs up, thumbs down, green check, red X, you know, as, as psychic omens, hearing somebody with a completely different specialized system. Um, I'm still thinking about that and um, cymatics and a whole lot of other funky mojo. Wow. Before you start blowing people's minds away, <laughs> why don't you? Give us a little bit of like intro about you and who you are and how you've been generally, you know, on this planet. You know, we're not talking about other planets. <laughs> so go ahead. Well, yeah. If we're not talking about other planets, so th this life, this dimension, this reality. Yeah, I, all, all those yeah. disclaimers for everyone who's like, I be everything. Yeah, I get grounded, folks. Um, so, yeah, my name is David Solomon. I live in California. Um, I've been studying and practicing um, magic, science, health, uh, financial mastery, and a lot of related topics um, for about 17, no, not 17, gosh, sorry, 12. So it's like, like oh, yeah, you don't years, want yeah, to, give or take. You, you don't want to give your age away. So yeah, that's, I mean, chronological age is fixed, biological changes. I really don't give a crap. <laughs> you know, if some people do, they can, <laughs> they can enjoy that or you could blip it out. But um, yeah, I started doing astral projection and energy work um, and tarot readings at 12. And I got really into it. Um, and then an anti-bullying spell I um, kind of invented um, right when I was 13 kind of scared me in its power and effectiveness. So mm -hmm. I started going deep in the spiritual study route. And so I looked into Buddhism, looked into um, Kabbalistic models of magic, looked really deep into personal growth psychology, spent a whole long time overlapping other careers as an artist, making like beautiful, enchanting, intricate art. Um, so I, I love this stuff because it's trippy and fun. Um, but it also reminds me of things that I like to create on some level. This is Isis, the goddess of magic here, uh, or a goddess of magic, depending on, you know, the viewer. And, um, you know, I started a lot of businesses. I have a book out called Magic is Real, a couple others in the works. Um, I love teaching and mentoring and innovating in the, the fields of magical science. Um, so as we were talking about, um, you know, before we started here, looking into certain devices that can measure the energy that comes off the body, uh, in energy healers or in chakras. It's called biophotons, bio for life, photons for light. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to build off uh, Albert Fritz Pop's research. He's the first one who found cells communicate in bursts of light in the body. Um, mm. So a friend of mine helped me find a device that actually can take the information of a crystal, a goddess, a person, sunlight, record it, encode it, and transmit it uh, mm -hmm. and charge something with it. So these uh, little coins I have in my highly functional, somewhat fashionable headband are charged with like thousands of healing frequencies. Um, mm -hmm. And so to have a device to use them and experiment with plant growth and ascension speeds, you know, he healing, yeah, we all want healing. Healing is great, but I am, I'm excited about acceler accelerating uh, spiritual development, like an individual collective and a planetary basis. So it's my current jam. Wow, amazing. All right, uh, Daitina, let's introduce just a little bit about yourself and also if you have any questions for David, go ahead. <laughs> well, hi, David. It's really nice to get to know you. I'm slightly blown away, but yet not. I too started a very big part of my journey at 12. So... <laughs> um. I was doing Jinchen Jitsu and EMDR and got my first certification when I was 12 in those modalities. So practicing just the uh, Jinchen Jitsu with the pulses of the body 
And mm -hmm. then from there, transitioning to looking at a person with them interactively and just staring into their eyes mm -hmm. and seeing the dramatic energy connection that was going on between myself and whoever, you know, whoever it is that I was working with. And so from there, I started really developing the seeing technique of energy. And so when you're speaking of this, I'm not sure the device that you're using, but I could almost see the energy when you brought it up out of your head and I can identify as well with the ISIS because I work directly with ISIS <laughs> and Horus um, within my personal practice. So way to go. I love that, uh, these synchronicities. And as far as myself, <laughs> uh, this is only my second time doing a video and I'm honored to be here with both of you. And I do a lot of different work as far as the life coaching or readings and now doing the online interviewing and offering a, a supportive outlet for the internet. Mazel tov. Wow. I'm glad you're here. I'm grateful for your existence. Yeah, the internet is going to get blown away very soon now that, that Tina is online. Uh, <laughs> At least YouTube is. I don't think internet is going to go away. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, David, like maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you, because I've taken some coaching sessions with you. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about like how you kind of help people and what kind of people you kind of, or what kind of clients you kind of resonate with. Maybe you can, we can start from there. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really glad you asked because I, I constantly evolve um, my practice, myself, and how I serve. Um, I think that's really important for anybody who uh, sees themselves as a professional and has a growth mindset. Um, so right now, I'm, and I don't wear this stuff all the time. This is just for fun. If you're setting up before the show, um, but right now I'm I'm really focused on if somebody, and I'll, I just if I'm speaking to you as you're watching, I'm speaking to you. If not in general, but if if you have a deep resonance that you want to dedicate to mastery in your own modalities, in your own life, in your own path, in your own authenticity, um, then I'm the person for you. I really love serving people who are serious about their growth and their path and their purpose and their passion, or at least identifying those to start. Um, for actually a very long time, I did a lot of healing work and I still do, um, but I find that there's a certain internal identification um, that can lead to a need to be healed, an identification of victimhood or of woundedness. And once I shift out of that personally, I realized that, well, I can help people wake up and help people accelerate um, the process of their own self-healing and teach all this awesome biopsych, trauma release, energy healing, chakra alignment, soul integration, past life recollection, psychic ability building, you know, all the cool, fun stuff. Right. I really... Um, I'm really inspired by shifts in global consciousness and shifting the course of the world to get us in a new golden age. So, um, you know, for, for individuals who know who they are, want to know who they are and want to make the impact that they can make in the, this world and literally be all that they have the capacity to be and then raise that capacity, that's what I'm really excited about. Um, and I usually do that work um, on calls once or twice a week for um, really at least three months to get a, a real significant shift. Um, and also, um, you know, workshops and masterminds and community groups and things like that as, as it's all in flow. Um, and that's really, uh, that's really fun work to do. Amazing. Uh, what, go ahead, Atina, you go ahead. I love what you said about the ones that are really wanting to do the work and that are serious about where they are going, where they've been, what they've done. So um what are those identification markers? And do you do any sort of pre-screening? Are there, is there a yes or a no when you get a feeling off of someone? Is it yeah, a I mean, as, as soon as I see an email or a message, I just pick up on the vibration if it's gonna work or not, even if I don't actually, my mind doesn't process the words. Um, and I've, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've hired and had hiring and management decisions. And I think my, my empathy, my psychic ability and just vast experience has 
uh, integrated in that way. So it can be really quickly. So somebody reaches out, I know right away, this person would like one session or three sessions that they want to work for a year, or they just want validation for a story and it's not really a, a fit type of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think most people know within themselves if, if what I described defines them. Um, I think certain qualities are, you know, a dedication to living a certain life and making a certain impact. Um, ever since I remembered why I incarnated into this, you know, mortal lifetime, I realized the intention I set for this life, and that was, you know, synonymous with the definition of a life purpose. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I feel lucky to have known that and have known the definition for that. Um, but that's something that I knew I couldn't rest kind of like Iron Man in, in Endgame <laughs> until yeah. my mission was, was actualized or, you know, I don't want to say died trying, but I, I knew that was what I was dedicated to in terms of an impact and in terms of a link. Um, so a lot of times people reach me and they're like, I'd like to get there. I have connections to my higher self. I have connections to 5D, but that purpose isn't super clear. Um, and so in that sense, we might do some clearing work because um, it, it can take, you know, a fair amount of clearing work and limiting belief clearing to allow the, you know, idea of a purpose to become the embodied, lived in truth of a purpose. Wow. <clears throat> I'm blown away already. So, uh, oh, how so? <laughs> maybe they, <laughs> how so? Um, I do share genetic material with hair dryers, but you know, it wasn't much <laughs> left. I, <checked. laughs> I was going to ask you, how did it start for you? Was it like a, you know, like, was it like a, what was the defining moment for you or like the moment where you realized that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? I mean, I knew when I was five, um, <laughs> I really did. I, I, I was just mm-hmm. obsessed with magic, but it's, as far as career path goes, Honestly, it was when I brought in the grounded Western world and I started learning some of Brendan Bouchard's material. Um, I was building a company in Silicon Valley in 2015 and it was an AI ed tech platform. So if you go to learn any course online, it's you know education technology, AI, artificial intelligence. So I was gonna help people learn as quickly as possible to retrain for new skills for career changers or people who software did their job for them like travel agents and they needed to retrain. And when I was at a very, very prestigious high level networking event, um, my body collapsed, like my physical health just went <clears throat> and you know, I take pretty good care of myself. And so I, I did one of those inward journeys. I'm like, okay, this is a dark night, um, you know, moment, however long it lasts, what's up. And I, I realized the truth that, you know, I was here to, to work and serve spiritually. But back then I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know if that meant I had to be a celibate monk with a shaved head in a cave or like, you know, a stereotypical cult leader, which I, I knew that wasn't me. And I had one teacher uh, who ran an energy healing school, but that didn't, at least that person, that school, that wasn't something I wanted to replicate identically. So Brendan Bouchard um, had a book called The Millionaire Messenger, and he trains people how to, um, you know, have careers out of teaching and speaking and writing and coaching and sessions and all that stuff. And it was honestly that Lokesh combined with the school I was in um, which is very private. And I'll, I'll, I tell people when they reach out individually, but it's not online. Um, so if it's a fit, I'll, I'd pass them on and it's, it's very effective. But I realized that it's possible to have a career with integrity as a spiritual professional. And what I've been learning over the last few years, and so that was like 2015, 2016, even though I had done a lot of things that I do, I'd done speaking and teaching and coaching and consulting and mentoring and, and healing stuff. I just didn't see it as an integrated career. Um, and I think now what I'm most mindful of is a lot of people put like spiritual teachers in a box and expect certain, you know, sub boxes to be checked and other ones not to be checked. Um, and I think that's, that's total bullshit. Uh, you know, there is, there is somebody who is a YouTube teacher who I really loved and this person's um, following crumbled because a controversy erupted because one of this person's um, followers, audience members, students, whatever, um, you know, got super triggered, came out in their process, wrote a long scathing article. And then the, the teacher person, you know, kind of pulled back and realized, oh, maybe, maybe they were messing up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I, I actually knew this teacher person's bodyguard. <laughs> and I'm like, so what happened there? And he said, they, they just tried to be perfect. They tried to be in a, put on a perfect face all the time and not be themselves. And 
I think that's, that's something I've been learning um, in my own work, in my own video creation. Like, you know, sometimes you can be a Zen as a Hindu cow and sometimes you're just chill and irreverent. Um, but that doesn't mean you're not woke. That doesn't mean you don't have skills. That doesn't mean you don't have practices and grounded experience or, and good days and bad days. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very interesting intersection between like a brand image, like does Sadhguru ever get constipated and it's painful? <laughs> you know, we, we probably wouldn't see it on camera, but he is in a human body. So maybe, maybe not, but I'm not saying that I love you Sadhguru, but I think we need to humanize uh, spiritual thought leaders Mm -hmm. um because there's so many permissions of that taken away and i think just like magazines photoshop their models the I, i'm not going to model something that's unreasonable like eckhart tolle who seems very consistent in how he comes across that may be who he is and i, I love and honor him for that but if it's not if it's just a face he wears on camera um i think that does a lot of disservice to the world. And I haven't seen his recent stuff, just, you know, some interviews. Um, because until we get to our equivalent of that, we, we need to accept ourselves for fully who we are. Absolutely. Yeah. I had yeah. to write that down actually, because I, I totally agree. Uh, humanize the spiritual thought leaders. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, since we're talking about, you mentioned something about a mystery school, or some people call it like a secret, uh, not secret. Uh, I think mystery school is probably the best word for it. But maybe, Daitina, you can share with us, uh, from what I understand, you've also been uh, part of like different schools and lineages. So maybe you can share with us what you feel about like the mystery schools and why some things are kept secret, you know. It's, yeah. it's because of the knowledge. And, you know, when you're going through certain areas of your life there, you almost need a mentor or a teacher or a shaman or something of that nature. So a lot of that is out of protection for the human psyche, as well as the human development, as well as this other AI technology that we could go down that really likes to, I don't like the word attack, but it does become a magnet for some of that information so I really feel that it's considered a mystery out of protection um, mm -hmm. and some of them that aren't so sincere are cults mm -hmm. you know and can be harmful to the actual person themselves so I like the step system where you really are taking into context what you're learning, how you're learning it, and who you're learning it from, and then going within and resonating or not with it. Wow. Um, I'm speechless. David, do you want to add anything to that about the, uh, the mystery schools? Yeah. Um... Big time. So Dean Radin uh, is a scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, co-founded by Edgar Mitchell. And they do all this research in the science of magic, like telepathy, telekinesis. Um, can you sense if somebody staring at you? Um, is chocolate, chocolate zapped with intention? Tastes better than chocolate not zapped? And a good study answer is yes. yes and so I asked him, I'm like, yeah, yeah, right, for sure. So he wrote this book, Real Magic, which is super cool, way more direct, talking about people who levitated and all this other stuff. I said, Dean, you know, I want magic to be everywhere. And Dean said that might be dangerous. If magic were ubiquitous, ever present, the world would erupt in a fireball in 30 seconds because some crazy angry teenager would, you know, flip a light and cast a super spell. I think there's a, I think there's a truth and an unbased fear in the mystery school secrecy gig. I, I very much feel that just like guns have restrictions in most places, certain types and techniques of magic should have restrictions. Like there's things that I will never practice and I will never talk about because any intelligent viewer can, can wonder why. So I'm not even going to give a clue. Like for the longest time I would have binding spells and all my teachings. Cause I, I had a fear that, you know, certain things would get out. Um, I think in the cosmic sense though, there's a bit of surrender. 
that we can pull in. Like there's a certain reason, like Dalai Lama and a lot of other folks have talked about, there's a certain reason why mystery schools are proliferating. It's not just the internet. The internet was around in you know, the 80s and anybody who was really intense could have found stuff. Um, there's so many teachers out there of this stuff and so many witchcraft books and spell books and light and dark and all that other stuff. It really takes the commitment of a student to learn. And I think if somebody's committed to learn, they're gonna find a way to learn whatever they wanna learn. Um, I think more mystery schools done well, like I agree with you that you know, they, they spread safety. And just like you know, in, in like a good judo dojo or good Aikido, you learn how to throw somebody and disable them from attacking you without physically harming them. And if you're you know, great at psychology, in my opinion, you could disable the conflict. And if you're great at chi and intuition, you could either avoid the conflict or give one subtle nudge and then things would shift away from the continuum that could even lead in the ballpark of, you know, something physical happening, which, um, you know, that's, that's a whole, you know, separate thing. Um, so I think it's, it's great that a lot of people are teaching and experimenting. I also think we have an evolution in our culture. Like people, not everybody used to be able to read. Now everybody can, most everybody can read. And uh, can what do you mean by, uh, sorry to interrupt, what do you mean by read? Oh, you mean actually. Reading. I thought you yeah, yeah, about like, like a reading. Like I thought you talked about energetically yeah. reading people. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you live near the Shaolin yeah. Temple, like that's yeah. it, unless you dedicate like a oh. portion of your life to finding another school or even hearing about it. So I think mm. now having so much accessibility is good. I think why we need magic to be more ubiquitous, maybe not entirely in everyone's you know equal power levels. I mean, maybe you need. Mm to capture a solar flare to have enough energy to burn up the earth and Dean's fear was a caricature of the real truth. Um, mm -hmm. But I think just like with electrical power or pounds per square inch that your body or a device you can operate can exert in the physical world, I think just because we can, we can bend or ignore Newtonian physics doesn't mean we can do that to an limited infinite degree. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I use astral black holes whenever I remove energy and healings, but I have never been concerned that they're maybe, gonna grow in size to swallow the world. Yeah, maybe you have to break that down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What, what do you mean by the black, uh, what, what kind of black holes did you say? Uh, so black holes absorb light. Yeah. And a lot of healer folks I've met, you know, if somebody has some dark energy or a wound or some scar or whatever, the healer mm -hmm. might pull it out and send it to the field or source or love or the, the earth. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, just sent it to another universe through a visualized black hole. It's just a different technique working with the different oh, paradigm. Oh, visualized black hole. Wow. Yeah. Great. Uh, Datina, do you have anything to add to that? When you're sending it out to the black hole, um, what is the difference between sending it to the earth versus sending it to the sun versus sending it to a black hole? For sure. So if sent to the sun, say the sun is 100% pure, you send it a pound of garbage and the sun is like a fraction of a percent less pure until it burns it up. Same, same with the earth, right? Like we, we could say there's so much healing for Gaia to do. And I see how people could say, you know, you don't want to take something out of the system. But I, I believe in being real about unity consciousness. And in unity consciousness, all is all. There's a place for love. There's a place for death. There's a place for bliss. There's a place for torture. I don't want to experience torture and suffering in my reality. So if somebody has that vibration in them, sure, it can be transmuted and you can clear the, the raw components and clear the energy signature and all that. Or you could say there's a place for that, this. It's not in the world I'm in. I'm not going to introduce it to the system. The system is doing a lot. I'm just going to send it out to another universe, which is on the other side of black holes. And that is a universe which, and then I, I leave it up to the divine. And if the divine wants to change or transmute that energy or shift it and send it back to the earth, or if it's somebody's karma here to get it next, fine. Um, at some level, I think it's all story and none of it matters. And we're just balls of light pretending the colors around us change and we're in these human bodies. So, you know, if somebody came and said, I want to do a Catholic exorcism on you to heal your ulcers and it worked, and that was a story we worked in instead of black holes or at back to Gaia or working with angels or whatever. Like, honestly, if, if it's successful, it doesn't matter to me at least. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, where, where does like kind of trust come into? Because uh, Daitina and I also, we did another podcast a couple of days back. We were talking about trust. Like how do you really trust that whatever you're sensing or intuiting is kind of the truth, you know? Um, in a psychic way or a healing session way or what? Um, in any way, like how do you trust your feelings or your thoughts? Like, I, it's for, for me that that evolved as I learned to trust my intuition. Um, mm -hmm. So like a simple example is with food. I'd be, at, I'd be at a grocery store and my mm -hmm. mind would be like, oh, I want this. And I would just get a no or a part of my body would tighten. Um, mm -hmm. or my breath would catch, or I would feel like resistance in the air, or I would see a clairvoyant X over it. I would get a different intuitive nudge. Sometimes it was a clairsentient, nonverbal, don't buy that. Sometimes it was a like clear empathic, I don't know the clear of the heart, but it was like a, a psychic feeling. And I, I just know when I paid attention to that, life went well. And when I didn't, life mm -hmm. went poorly. Um, and I think a while back, I did this real long interview about the difference between intuition and imagination. Um, and I think that that's in the positive head interview number two on my, my site, magicalgoldenh.com. Um, I, I might be wrong, but I think it's there. But, you know, imagination is generated from the mind. The mind is a temporary construct of the ego rooted in 3D and fear and lack and mm -hmm. skittishness. And the intuition is soul. It's knowing. It's still. It's consistent. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if I ask, if, if you ask me the question, will you move to Brazil tomorrow? I would say, no, that'd be from Seoul. I don't have to think about it, right? right, right. If you say, will you move to Brazil if I give you $10 billion for a research lab and you have 10 days to make a decision, I'd say, probably, let me think about it, yeah. right? But, yeah. but in like, you know, I do this all the time with cheat days. I'll do, I have a real intense fitness routine and I'll do a cheat day every two weeks. And, you know, I use the mind to confirm like, okay, I know this is coming from a desire of the inner child. I know if it's the inner child, I am, you know, judging that as a perceptual distortion, as a block, as a feeling of lack, as whatever. And I think the, the mind can be really, really useful when the soul isn't clear or consistent because of a perceptual block. And, uh, you know, we all have been triggered in life. And I think with enough self-awareness, we can know um, when we can trust our intuition and when not. Um, but I think for the most part, if I pick up something from a person or from the globe um, in a session or in a trance state, I think for anything truly significant, it's, it's healthy to ground it with the mind. That's why I'm doing biophotonic research, because even though I know energy work and chakras are, are real, um, for the people who operate at a level of mind where they don't even believe in intuition, this is a bridge. It's, it's meeting people where they're at. And it's also honoring myself. If I feel my ever, intuition's ever in question, it's nice to have an anchor in what uh, you can call consensus reality. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. I was going to go a little bit into the technology, uh, the AI and stuff like that. But Daitina, do you have any other questions or do you want to add to that? No, go ahead. <laughs> So since David, you were talking about the technology and we're both in the Silicon Valley, maybe, yeah, I, I was like, maybe we should be doing this together. Maybe next time, we, you know, we talked about it. But anyway, uh, Silicon Valley, a lot of technology companies and, uh, you know, Elon Musk and basically the AI. So how do you feel like the technology? Because a lot of people talking about transhumanism, like, you know, like the neuro, uh, what do you call it? Neuralink. Neuralink. Yeah. So what do you feel like? Is it a good thing or bad thing? Or, you know, like there's no... I think it's a bunch of this, to yeah. be honest. Um, so what, there is what a is, book. Yeah. There's a bunch of this. Uh, <laughs> um, there, there were two books, one book and one series that scared the crap out of me right when I moved to the Valley and transhumanism was sexy because I was... I was um, <clears throat> it wasn't sexy. That was a mistruth that I cleared. Thank you, self. It was... Um, let me expand a bit. I know you like the headband, but I, uh, this was a very emotional topic for me and I want to speak it um, with clarity. Um, so I see my own system isn't clear about it yet. So I'll, I'll go a bit more slowly with this because it's, it's so it's such advanced fields. So, mm -hmm. you know, for anybody who's not super familiar, transhumanism is essentially how much of our being do we want to be cyborgs? You know, right? Yeah. And 
coming from a perspective of, oh, we don't live long enough. Our bodies are inferior. Therefore, we have to replace the parts. Our brain is inferior. Therefore, we have to upgrade it. I think if that's done with the right intention, it's just the same thing as having a healthy diet. Like, I wear this Bluetooth. People could say this Bluetooth is bad for my brain. I think I do. In fact, I'm certain I do enough to negate the negative effects. And I, I look forward to getting the lab equipment to prove that. I think that mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah. Um, I think the dangers of transhumanism are too much of a disassociation from our humanity. And I think any, anybody would say that, but if something said often, there's, you know, a resonance of truth. So, yeah. you know, you could say, well, obviously for somebody who's paralyzed, getting a chip in their brain to walk again is legit, but then where do you draw the line? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm actually prepping for a degree in quantum neuroscience and in studying genetic engineering, I also like to study DNA activation or in the tribes mm -hmm. to say galactivation. <laughs> so like, you know, say somebody's mm -hmm. pregnant and they want to pick an embryo that's more intelligent than average. And then, you know, you meet somebody in your life or in your family who, you know, could benefit and would like to raise their intelligence more than what software and diet can do. How do you tweak their genes in a safe, healthy way as a living person to raise their intelligence and would that be on par, better than, worse than, you know, use simple words, getting a chip to boost their intelligence, you know, and we'll say analytical intelligence or musical, like one vector, because I know there's a lot. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think we don't even know what a human being completely is. When the appendix, appendixes were removed without thought, we didn't realize they were a storehouse for the microbiome. I had my tonsils taken out as a kid and I only learned later in life of the value they had. I was circumcised as a baby because of the cultural tradition of my family. And as, as an adult, if I could have chosen for that to happen, I, I'd say no. I'd honestly, I'd say I wanna be a super shaman and make, make it appear or disappear based on how I'm feeling and what I wanna do, but that's a whole separate thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the dangers of transhumanism is say, say you have somebody who gets triggered really often and they don't have a severe mental illness. They're just testy, moody, you know, whatever judgy word we want to use because it's easy. And they want to replace their amygdala with a synthetic amygdala and embrace transhumanism. They might be robbing themselves of many years of the wound is the gift, really important growth because they went through a difficulty. They, they learned some big thing. Um, that being said, because this hasn't been done before and because I don't feel qualified or capable to get into a psychic state, to see the remote futures, to remote view the futures of when these are, are and aren't done, I'm not gonna comment further on it. Um, I would just say, I don't think people should rush to do things with their brains, but I also don't think we should put our heads in the sand like ostriches because technology is, is gonna progress and the world is gonna progress. Mm -hmm. Now for the AI and maybe um, extraterrestrial narratives and you know different layers of government narratives, I, I think that's all story. I think the only thing that matters is the here and now. And I think if anybody really wants to get involved in those fields, I'm not even gonna say rabbit holes, then that's a life path dedication in terms of making an impact. Um, I see a lot of people who study that stuff and they're interested and they, they complain or they get fearful, but they're not dedicating to be uh, an Elon Musk level entrepreneur or a politician um, like Schwarzenegger wasn't a career politician, regardless of anybody's thoughts of his policies, he was somebody who wanted to make an impact and do something. He came in, he did it, he left. And arguably, he, I, I think that sets one up for fewer special interest influences to lead with more integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if, if you or a viewer is like, hey, transhumanism, Neuralink, like it's bad, it's dangerous. There's a difference between having an opinion and making a change. Um, and I think it's, it's not hard to take that opinion, see if there's a passion see if there's a dedication, see if there's a career, and then make a change. Um, wow. Can I ask why you said it's emotional for you? I mean, if you don't have to answer that, but if you want to answer that. Oh, no, I'm, I'm an open book. Um, right. You know, I've, uh, I don't think I've fully processed everything related to all the topics of body image and sexuality. Um, I think we all have our own growth paths until we're glowing balls of light. And so in terms of replacing or augmenting or technologically changing parts of the body, I recognize I have some shadow that I haven't fully worked through. Um, and until I fully work through it, I acknowledge that 
sure, I can be clairsentient, but I, I acknowledge the block there and I don't want to be a disservice or, or pretend that a qualification in many areas equals a qualification in every area. And mm -hmm. like, I, I don't generally do things on women's reproductive health on a 3D level. I could possibly do it on a 5D. But, um, you know, I think, I think that's, that speaks to the, the field of psychics and healers as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm going to say something really controversial right now, but I think it needs to be said. If it's done right, I think energy healing needs to be regulated. Um, you know, if you see a massage therapist, mm -hmm. you can know how quickly they can undo a muscle knot and how many pounds of pressure they can do. If you see a surgeon, you know their success rate. But if you see an energy healer, you don't know if they're in an on day or an off day, or if they can live up to their game or not. You don't know how many biophotons are zapping you with per second. And wouldn't it be great if, okay, I, I, I know we have to be careful with medical languaging, so I'll just speak for myself because I am brushed up on that. If I had a cancer diagnosis and it was a stage one or two and it wasn't severe, I am certain that I would do everything I could to find out how many biophotons would it need to change this cancer and with, who's the most accessible healer and how many sessions would it take to get treated to get the cancer removed? Um, one of my teachers said somebody came to her with cancer and she was working on them and their healing journey ended up being, I think like four or five times faster than, than statistical average based on all their other data points. And so, you know, she couldn't say she sped up the healing of his cancer or she healed it. Um, but I'd, I'd like to think that if that's a baseline, how, how can we replicate that level of skill? And I think that the field of healers and psychics, there's such a bias to being overly right-brained. And I, I, I have had a lot of this too, which is why sometimes I can speak so analytically because my temperament is more right-brained. And mm -hmm. um, But I think it gives so much clarity. And I think as healers, it can be really helpful for us because if somebody comes in, instead of saying, let's work on it and see, I think if we can clairvoyantly tune and or use devices to figure out what's needed, we can give so much clarity for people on their healing journey and our field as a whole can rise in credibility. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you go to a tarot reader and you want, you want her to accurately, you know, talk about something in your future or your past, and maybe if somebody's third eye is open more widely and their throat is more clear, the biophoton data will be different. Like they're speaking from truth and they see what they can see, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe in three different psychics, the numbers would be different and you can see who's the best psychic, not by what yeah. they look like, not by how they talk, not by their online brand, but just by like checking it out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, sorry, that's a long-winded answer to a, a simple question. Oh, that's great. Uh, Tina, I'm sure you have to add to that because you are also a healer and you work with many modalities. So go ahead. <laughs> I think the finest line there is going back to this favorite saying I have is humanize the spiritual thought um, leaders. And yeah. I think the, the healers and the readers and the psychics, part of their disconnect is the reaction and response that they're getting from the people that they're working on or with because yeah. of these built up expectations of you're going to heal me, you're going to save me and all of this um, distorted energy, at least I feel for myself. You know, if someone came to me and said, heal my cancer, I'm going to say, go somewhere else. But yeah. they came to me with cancer and they said, here I am. Oh, let's work with you. You know, anyway, um, so having something else is a new idea for me to gauge where maybe I'm coming from. I can look at that and say, am I on point today? <laughs> you know, is there something yeah. I can't see that um, I need to work on? I would love that and yeah. uh, be able to stay as centered and balanced within my energetic field as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally feel you. If somebody comes in with that much ego, then you're like, whoa, hey. Um, but, you know, I, I like, again, like the parallel to massage therapist, if I, if I have a knot in my traps, my trapezius muscle, and it's really bugging my neck and all the yoga and the healing work can't, can't, you know, release it. And I want to get a massage. I really want to know 
if if I go to a massage place, if they can fix it. And if it isn't yeah. fixed after I leave, I want to know, will it take two more visits? Will it take three more visits? And one of the d- biggest reasons I got so passionate about spiritual healing is I had 10 years of back pain where I could barely sit down. I had MRIs. I had prolotherapy, which is analgesic free, meaning fully extremely painful injections a dozen at a time into the back. I, I spent tens of thousands of dollars on chiropractic massage and acupuncture. And it was all like everybody had different opinions of what was happening and, and how it could be fixed. And uh, honestly, same thing for a lot of the different healers I saw in terms of what things meant. One person's narrative was, oh, you are in pain, therefore you're damaged. Mm-hmm. One person, you're in pain, therefore there's something of yourself that you have to change. And there, there wasn't like a clear and specific answer. And sure, that led to an inward journey that was helpful, but it's like it, ha- having that clarity can be really helpful. But yeah, we, we don't want to make the data our guide, right? Like if we, can't, if we can't quantify kindness, that doesn't mean kindness is less valuable. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, we have to hold it. We have to see like what it can do and what it what it can't and shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. You know, something's coming to me. It's like a what is that saying when you go into the military? Not be all that you can be, but it's something else. It's like uh, um, it doesn't. If it doesn't hurt, it it's not worth it. Oh, Ugh. if it doesn't, uh, it won't kill you. If it doesn't kill you. No, no. It's it's if it doesn't hurt. It, or something along the lines, what I'm trying to say is we have this mm, program. So it's a program that we have to suffer to learn. You need to go through this experience in order to reach this level of whatever. In order yeah. to succeed at building muscle, you need to dedicate an entire year of your life to have this perfect body that you're looking at. So it's everywhere that we're looking, it's this prolonged effort time and deliverance and when you're in pain or suffering it's not always the best to sit there and go through suffering after suffering after suffering after suffering right like i I feel you you like this is this is a perfect synchronicity i was literally just talking with my best friend yesterday about shifting out of the program that it's painful to learn yeah and that too yeah right and how about the other one you have to work hard to make good money Yes. A hard day's work. Like, yeah, All of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, the belief system, right? Because the pro- the language kind of uh, programs us into belief systems and which we think yeah. are always going to be true, but, you know, they can change, right? Yeah. I mean, my breatharian teacher talked about a buddy of his who got bored of being breatharian, but didn't want to go back to quote unquote normal. So just mm-hmm. ate only ice cream every day, three times a day. His body mm-hmm. comp didn't change. He just wanted to eat, but didn't want to lose his breatharianism. So he took out all the meaning of food and calories and sugar and was at a high enough spiritual level to tra- have the ice cream be transmuted to whatever he wanted it to be. Um, and so that was, that's kind of hilarious. And like, yeah, I think, I think when we can liberate ourselves from, from story that, that builds our power as reality creators even more. Mm. Wow. Bettina, you have any other questions for David? Um, I'm sure we can go in so many different, not rabbit holes, but <laughs> I don't know what's the other way to say, like a good rabbit hole. How would you say it? good rabbit hole? Booty hole. Did you say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to turn this into a comedy show. You could say white hole. I'm, I'm a huge fan of white holes in physics. Um, they're kind of the opposite of black holes. Like they exude matter and energy. Mm-hmm. And in Lucy, best transmission ever. I watched that movie twice in a row, back to back when it came out. They, they did this really cool visualization for going into a black hole in one universe and coming out a white hole of the other one. Um, and I think in Pacific Rim 1, they like alluded to that idea as well, which is kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, portals can be funky. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's a cool topic for the theme of abundance related to energy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we see chakras as vortexes and we believe we're part of infinite source, it, it feels, even for, for me, it feels like a hard stretch to instead of saying like, oh, I have 30,000 magic energy units in me and that I can use to cast a spell and I can pull some in from a divine source. Um, it, it feels, it, my, I, don't, I don't feel my mind has been ready to shift like this is a hand, now this is three hands. But 
feeling the black hole inside of an acupoint, inside of a chakra, inside of our toroidal energy field core, and realizing, wow, this is this is the accent point for unlimited infinite energy. The story is it, it could be we're part of source. The story is this could mm. be where God gives me strength. The story is it could be true nature, whatever, whatever the story is. Um, mm. But I, I do feel that that's like an accessible physical place where abundance can, can come mm. from and be generated by. And that's, that's just, it's so exciting. Magic is so much fun. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so what kind of, uh, because you also said you also do workshops. So right now, maybe we, before we get to that, like maybe we can talk a little bit about how you're sensing or feeling about this whole COVID-19 and the whole lockdown thing. Like what is your intuition telling you? It's like, yeah. Because of censorship, I'm not going to share my opinion on right. um, certain aspects of it because right. cause and effect. Um, yeah. But I think in a spiritual sense, um, you know, I tuned into it in uh, April of 2020, um, and it hit the area where I was living around March. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to know what's going on because this seems mm -hmm. really major. And mm -hmm. so many people are saying so many different things. And you know, what's actually happening? And I tuned in to Sa Sagittarius A mm -hmm. and center of the universe, big black hole slash white hole slash you know who knows. And I'm like, yo, divinity, what's up? And I saw this huge pulse of energy, interdimensional. And I saw the 5D, you know, this is with a, this is with 3D sight, because we can visualize in 3D being embodied in 3D, even though we exist in other dimensions, we can only illustrate a metaphor for higher dimensions in 3D. So I saw in 3D, a wave of 5D go out, and then a wave of 4D behind it, and a wave of 3D behind that. Mm -hmm. So you could call, you know, if, if 3D is electromagnetism and 4D is astral and scalar and biophotonic, you could say 5D is intention, you know, quantum, mm -hmm. hologram, karma, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I feel that those, those of us who were tapped in, tuned in, turned on to the higher vibrations felt that 5D early had this massive purging, maybe even had it before COVID started. I was excited because I, I do work online. I'm like, oh, everyone's going to be spending time online. You know, audience numbers are going to go up. <laughs> But I felt so much cleansing before COVID happened that I'm like, okay, this is pushing, uh, this is a ripple that's going up from the center of the universe. It has nothing to do with the politics or biology of the sliver of time that mm -hmm. the world is talking about. Like, you know, the earth has been around, what, 4 billion years, a year and a half of something weird is like nothing, right? Like, yeah, it's a big deal in the 3D, but it's like mm -hmm. nothing cosmically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to ground it back in a second. It's like, okay, what's what's the energy of this thing? Mm -hmm. And then what's the physical experience of this thing? And what, is it, what does it mean? Okay, there's a clearing and a cleansing because it just passes through everything. So mm -hmm. what's being cleared, what's being cleansed, what's being pushed out? I think mm -hmm. anybody who looks deep into like political narratives and isolation narratives mm -hmm. and lack of transparency about the healthcare system narratives and centralized control narratives, is gonna see if they really look at things in the last 10 to 15 years, there has been a massive cleansing in all of those arenas. Um, I think if you're holding a glass of water and you drop it and it breaks and the water is everywhere and the glass is everywhere and some cuts your foot and you have dinner guests and the party environment is disrupted and you freak out because you drop a glass, at some point the glass is gonna be cleaned up and things return to normal, but they'll never be the same because that individual glass is gone. Yeah. Right. I think that's a good metaphor for COVID. I think uh, so many of us are freaking out about the shattered glass and not actually cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. um, and there might only be so much we can do. Like we could get a new glass, but it might take time to be delivered or go to the store. You could talk about that economically. You could talk about that with health. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I really think that the key to not suffering from everything related to COVID is just a bit more perspective. Um, mm -hmm because there is only so much we have control of without, you know, significant effort. Yep. Um, I can say effort, it's effortless to control things, but le levitate over here in a Ferrari that you materialize out of Skittles and, you know, <laughs> we'll drink like this. Yeah, I was going to ask about vaccines, uh, but maybe, Daitina, do you have uh, anything to add to that? No. Okay, so... There, there is ahead. something I can say about vaccines, actually, yeah, which ahead. shouldn't... Which, probably which shouldn't be censored at all. 
So, right. you know, vaccines have a molecular resonance. They have stuff in them. Yeah, they're new. Yeah, they haven't been tried. You can ask P double PhDs about the safety and which one. But there's a really cool company that I'm working with that um, distributes the device, the biophoton device I'm getting. And they actually use energy medicine to, so they say, neutralize the negative effects of the vaccine. And this is something I think everyone can do. It's like whether vaccines will be mandata mandated or passport tracked with the chip and all of that stuff, that's its own separate story. I'm going to step back from that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those of us who got vaccines when we were kids, those of us who drink water, that tap water anytime in life, or breathe the air of the exhaust of cars that are not electric, as we do all the time, we're constantly being exposed to toxic yeah. particles. Right. So a vaccine, in my opinion, is just that concentrated with the uniqueness of an mRNA vaccine. Um, but I do think there's an easy way to remove fear and look at cause and effect. If you feel there's going to be a cause that is negative, how do you neutralize it so it doesn't have negative effects? Uh, and there's a million ways of doing that. So I, I really think that even if we shift into a reality where vaccines become mandated, I, I'm not afraid. Like I'm not afraid of having a 5G phone because I feel I neutralize that in my system. Um, and we could talk about, you know, again, political stories related to it, but to an end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, same thing about chemtrails and the the pest. I mean, the GMO stuff in the food. It's like the same thing. I feel the same that, um, um, you know, if I have the power, maybe power is not the right word, but if I'm sovereign enough or if I'm powerful enough, I'm using the power word again. But basically, it's coming back for a reason, I guess. Is I'm powerful. If I'm a powerful being, then nothing should really affect me, whether it's, it's like. Trees Shoot or yourself in the hand and tell me if that still holds. Was that? Shoot yourself in the hand and tell me if that still holds. No, I mean that's that's called self destruction and suicide. But I'm talking. <laughs> no, no I'm talking... If, if you have unlimited power, make your hand impervious to bullets, like the most powerful Shaolin oh. monk. Like I think we oh, all have yeah. the access, the potential, the five D quality. But I think we also incarnated yeah. into three D bodies with three D time to experience what it's like being on oh. the continuum. Oh, I see. Yeah, I kind of misunderstood what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. I think that's what I was trying to say is like, I mean, that's where also I feel that placebo effect kind of comes into my mind is like, we can create a reality based on what we feel is right for us, like whether it's wrong or right, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, yeah, it depends on what we want, right? Like there, there's perceiving things, there's the meaning of things, there's a response in our own body. There's the effect of our quantum consciousness on the material reality that we share with other people. Um, you know, 3D, 4D, 5D, there are other people out there. You know, oneness exists, but for, for most purposes, it's, it's too convoluted to talk about duality and non-duality at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we are infinite creators, we are infinite beings, and we're learning as we go. Like we were all born pooping our pants and we learned that along the way and we're learning our own manifestation along the way. And also cheers to humanity because we're so resilient and we're always adapting and growing and we're so amazing. Our bodies are so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how many just like a hundred thousand chemical reactions per second per cell, like something insane like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. God of the autonomic nervous system. Like whatever yeah. you are, I worship you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like they talk about the supercomputer and like yeah we already are a supercomputer so <laughs> yeah. um that, and, that's actually really exciting quantum computing but that's a whole other <laughs> yeah <laughs> quantum exactly yeah tina and i were talking about the other day but since you mentioned 3d 4d i i think that tina we were talking about can you elaborate your thoughts on maybe ascent, whatever they call it, ascension or moving from one uh, dimension to the other or whatever, you know, there's different ways to say, but what do you feel about those different levels? Maybe. Uh, oh, I, were you asking, I think you were asking David, weren't you or me? Yeah, I was, I, I was asking your opinion about, uh, because since David mentioned like, 3D, 4D, 5D, and I was kind of thinking if you have anything to add to that. I liked the very ending of his statement the most that I can kind of tail into, I guess. Oh, yeah, go ahead, um, yeah. The 
desire to want to be something that you're not. So we are right now in this physical body, having this physical experience, having emotions, having a human a human body. And I really feel like the more we embrace that, the more levels of natural evolution or ascension will happen. Mm. So it's like, is it similar to grounding our bodies to the earth instead of like being out here in the space kind of thing? It's the desire, the need and the want. And so grounding this is acceptance and being present. And the more present you are, the more natural it is going to be for you to say, I want to fly right now. And you can, mm -hmm. you can get there. It's just fully embodying who you are as a human first, not desiring to be in the sky until you even know what that's, <laughs> what that means, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, David, uh, we started the conversation. I think you mentioned trauma a couple of times. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit because I think that, Tina, you have your thoughts around that trauma when we go through when we are born, right? Maybe you can share, us, uh, share with us a little bit about that and then maybe David can add to that maybe. Right now, we are being born into trauma, but we do not have to be. It's just where we are. So the birthing process is very important to our current situation. Um, and so seeing the, even just how you're born, you know, is it three hours, four hours, five, 16, really does show a timeline of a person's personality and their psychology. And then you have also what was going on in the birthing canal, the relationship that you were having with your parents. So not to get too much into that, it's just the actual trauma piece is where we are currently in our timeline of humanity is finally getting to those big, huge chunks. And I'm excited about that. It's like, <laughs> finally. It's, um, we're not stuck in the 1700s where we're just recycling souls and going through the same thing over and over and over and over again. We are here right now in 2021 with our mouths full of trauma. <laughs> trauma and ice cream. And so things that are too X-rated for this podcast. What? And things that are too X-rated for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah go ahead david do you want to add to that i have a love-hate relationship with trauma and i don't use the <laughs> word hate frequently um you know i i used to be so obsessed with releasing traumas and i just was led to a path of identifying with them anytime i wanted to change anytime there was resistance to change like, oh, there must be some micro trauma, some samskara, some cord mm -hmm. stored bit of cortisol emotion that was too overwhelming. And so my body stored it as fat or in heavy metals or whatever. And I have to experience to feel free of that. And I'm just like, to, to that yeah. whole thing for, for myself, right? <laughs> like, I guess I'm like, <laughs> right, 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 like suffering and growth. Like, yeah. Like, it, if you watch like some shows about, okay. Another Marvel magic moment in Age of Ultron, after Ultron, for anybody who saw it, anybody who didn't, there's like a bunch of robots. They cause all this chaos in the next scene. There's a character named Maria Hill and she's pulling a piece of glass out of her foot because the glass like broke from some windows inside because there was a fight. And, you know, that also happened in, um, I think, Die Hard. And this is a really interesting analogy because it's like looking directly at pain, looking directly at a wound, doing something that causes more pain and, and choosing to have no reaction, right? It's like, this is what it is. This is what it's gonna be. And I, I like to look at everything as patterns. Like I was talking with somebody about ADHD. I said, even just the words imply broken, damaged, negative. Yeah. There could be a pattern yeah. which supports who yeah. you wanna be and what you wanna do and a pattern which doesn't, but labeling it pathological is just, you know, like a punch in the gut, you know, li literally chakra wise. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I do think it's really critical to find like 
the parts of our source code that we want to change and why. And, you know, pain, pain is a motivator and pain serves a purpose for a lot of people in this world. Um, I know I stepped out of wanting to use the analogy of trauma and look at patterns of cause and effect and where they started. Um, but I don't think I would have gotten to this point if I hadn't learned what trauma was. I feel like there was stuff that was buried in my unconscious because of my childhood and my past. And mm. hearing the narrative that goes along with saying, oh, that experience was traumatic. Here's how you're compensating. Here's how your body, mind, spirit have adjusted. Can you cleanse or release that experience? The test is, can you think about it and talk about it and, and tell it in detail without reacting? I think that's a, that's a very basic trauma mm -hmm. test or even laugh about it, right? Yeah. And so I, I think it, it does have a place in our culture. I think there's, there can be a projection tendency like in all of us, especially those of us who are clairvoyant and turn it's like, oh, I don't want to work with trauma narratives. Therefore, nobody should. Like that's the same, you yeah. know, that's the exact same type yeah, of so egocentric. Yeah, same rabbit hole. It's like a different way to get to the same rabbit hole. Right, right. So it, yeah. it's a different set of tools. And also like you have yeah. viewers who are being brought in because maybe a, a critical mass of your viewers want to step away from the tra trauma narrative. That's why this conversation yeah. went the way it went. Um, it, it is a trickier scenario, though, because some people identify with with uh, this victimhood vibration. And it took me almost two years from when I heard about what it was until I, I feel like I released it to a significant enough degree. Um, mm -hmm. But whatever, some people are brazen and some people are like, get Tilly. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so we had the one hour mark. So we're going to try to wrap it up in the next few minutes. So Datina, I'll let you, I've uh, been speaking a lot. I'll let you ask any questions if you have for David. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to share yeah, anything oh, I about... Feel, I want to just feel for a second. <laughs> Give me a minute. Yeah, oh, wait, sure let, me, let me shift my biopod on a mission so you can feel something. Especially. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want us to close your... You want us to like close your eyes and feel into it, or you just want yourself to give you can have a drone some... deliver me some sushi, that'll have an impact. <laughs> do whatever you guys do. <laughs> I'm tripping already. Make, don't make me trip more, please. No, <laughs> no, oh my go god, ahead. 15 kangaroos hop up and down the hills as giant umbrellas pop out of their feet and spin radially, shooting out fountains of chocolate that turn 15 different colors every second. And in each color, you see the reflection of the cosmic sunlight uh, that is dripping off the breast of every single great galloping galactic goddess who ate a brownie from the cosmic tray of infinite brownie delights, allowing them to birth an entirely new generation of life-sized talking ferrets that speak nothing but the principal poetry of pretty, pretty ponies until the end of their pink days and the beginning of House in the Prairie Rewinds. She sells seashells on the seashore. That's all I don't know. Dude, I'm tripping. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Did well, you memorize just, that? Like, since, since we're in this vibe, I'm just going to say, David, what do you do for fun? Men. <laughs> do men. Okay. That's a good I Actually, that's a great men. question. I, I just... <laughs> um learned in the last couple of days um how to use power director which is a really cool video editing app and uh, you know i've made these videos and there's basic editing like like sound and jump cuts but i really wanted to learn how to do special effects and i especially wanted to make trippy psychedelic trancey trancey absorbing meditations so for fun i just unleash my creativity in whatever way i flow and mm -hmm learning how to edit videos was so exciting because I, I used to have an art studio with three rooms and 500 different types of alchemical paints and pigments and paint mediums and paper types and delivery tools like toothbrushes and whatever. And now it's like, wow, any video, any photo, any image within certain parameters is an ingredient to the artistic output that can mm. change and educate and trip out and be super fun. That is video and you know, eventually like VR. Um, I loved the right? video. I loved the video you sent us. Oh, thanks. Thanks. And the little figures in the background. I still have the picture of the guy sweeping in my head. Oh, do you? It's 
still, it's, it's okay. So you should totally insane. attach that video to this interview at, at some point, like in the middle of it as an intermission. What was your favorite part, Detina? The breathe, because the, the oh, part yeah. up at the top and then the exhale. Yeah. I don't, that, that was my favorite part, but I yeah. mean, all of it was uh, silly, but powerful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, mine was the Santa dancing Santa. <laughs> oh, the dancing Santa? Yeah, don't well, let Helen any details because that, that just gets so freaking great. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you liked it. And the, yeah, color, literally... the colors too. Yeah, just the whole thing was you could tell you were putting a lot of fun, intentional, spontaneous creativity in there that just manifested beautifully. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's fun to mix in surrealism with trippy shit. <laughs> so I have yeah. another question. What yeah. is one of your bedtime rituals? One more time. What is one of your bedtime rituals? Men. Uh, do men. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> Non-human hybrids with several extra finishes. <laughs> no. Um, my, one of my bedtime... So I actually have a very unique bedtime ritual in that I'll do everything I would normally do for sleep earlier than my bedtime and which, which changes. And I do that because my favorite meditation is blissing out into a sub samadhi, pure love, bliss, joy state, ascending to the highest level of consciousness I can perceive li literally and holding that as long as I can. And it's extremely energizing and it substitutes the need for sleep. So when I do that for three hours, I don't need those three hours of sleep. And it's really manifestation powerful in every respect. Um, and I used to have a list of like 85 things I wanted to do in an evening routine. And then I cut it down to 20 and then 10, which felt manageable. I would never do all 10. And so aside from like this basic grooming and stuff um, and like, you know, time each day for cleaning, I, um, you know, I shifted away from like reading inspirational material at night. I do that when I flow during the day, but I can, I can channel and download, you know, whatever vibes. Right. And I, I really just feel personally led to spend as much time as possible on the highest states of expansive, loving, joyful awareness possible. So that's wired into my being. And that's my waking day-to-day -day interaction experience a greater percent of the time. And just like if you lift weights for more minutes every day and every week, you're stronger. I feel like being in higher vibey states longer and like stretching yourself to the max um just has an effect and i i want to walk the talk and be a world-class expert and you know i i think any skill that the highest level shaolin monk or merlin has is accessible for any of us and um i i want to you know have all that stuff too as an example of embodied divinity it used to be i want to shoot fireballs for fun and so you know, I'm like, oh, if I can make sparks of light, people will invest in my stuff. It's like, okay, you can invent sparks of light, then what? <laughs> um, you know, like that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think just being in a joyful state and being able to manifest whatever is aligned to be um, is, you know, abundance. Mm. And that's what you do before you go to sleep? Like, I mean, typ typically. Visualize um, maybe, yeah. Well, it's, it's like a 14 step process, but visualization mm -hmm. is part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that you answer your question, Tatina? And if you have any others, go ahead. We still have maybe five or ten minutes. We can wrap it up. Um, what about your waking up? Yeah, that's actually really specific. The first half of my day is extremely uh, disciplined and routine. Um, more masculine energy in the beginning and feminine flow at night. So I normally um, don't get out of bed until I'm in love with life. Um, which is a Joe Dispenza recommended technique. So as soon as I realize I'm awake, any thoughts or patterns that come in, I will only think about things with joy and gratitude. And I'll generally go over all the major life topics. It isn't super structured. And that's before I get out of the bed and do anything. Um, and then really right away in the day, I wake up with a big charge. So I usually put on theta binaural beats right when I wake up um, because just the waking world is just so different from the sleep world. It just takes... It takes yeah. me a bit of time to adjust, you know, presently. Um, and then I, uh, I usually go for a walk and do some Wim Hof breathing. And I eat like a very strategic, like liquid fruits and veggie meal unless I'm doing a celery cleanse. 
Um, and then I do an hour or two of the, the work that's like the most time sensitive work. Um, and then I do a very intense workout for two to three hours, which usually combines cardio, visualized weightlifting, um, and inventing music videos while belting out karaoke songs I'm learning <laughs> in real time. So I usually do all that stuff for about three hours of yoga and Qigong. And then I take a shower and start the work day. Wow. So, so moving along with all of that, I could just so see your energy shifting and your vibration was getting higher the more you were talking about it. And it was really beautiful to witness. Thank, Thank you, you for Ta showing us that. Talking um, about what? Huh? Talking about what? Especially the morning routine. You just got brighter and brighter and brighter. And that was really beautiful. Like really beautiful. So yeah. as far as as far as these things that I'm asking you, um, where is there where's the room for the mess up day? Like sharing again, you know, you and I both having this recognition that we don't want to be put on pedestals. There's no, um, you know, just being the human that you were talking about before. So when you're embracing a human and you had like a off day. Can you share more about that acceptance of yourself? I, I just work on accepting it in real time and everything yeah. on my to-do list is, is a order of priority. So it doesn't matter if something goes poorly or something doesn't get done. Like it matters, I care. But on the flip side, um, you know, if I ever schedule out a day and I have an intention and a schedule from two to four and that doesn't happen for whatever reason and I don't do something that's better, like I, I'm drained or whatever, I just see it as an opportunity to, to build self-knowledge. And like, for one example, like the first day I started this routine, I was really sore and I was a little weak because I didn't plan out nutrition or chi to augment the breakdown of my muscles. And it took me like time to realize that because, you know, if there's less energy, the brain has less to work with. And so really I had about three days where I was at like 60, 70% right when I started this. And you could say, yeah, the body was adjusting, but um, I just accepted it. Um, for the longest time, I was a workaholic. And while I'm intentional about, I'd say every hour of my day, even hours that I spend in flow doing whatever, even if it's doing mobile games for 20 minutes, I'm just very aware of like why. Um, and so I think if, if I ever have off time, for me, I interpret that as what took me out of balance or do I just need to rest? Um, I, I almost workaholic to myself to death, literally with major heart and liver issues, uh, 2014 and 2015. Um, and so I really know the consequence of pushing when pushing shouldn't happen. Um, but I don't really judge myself negatively, or at least if that happens, I, I, uh, I don't stick in it. I used to, um, I used to play the subliminal affirmation track called drop the inner critic. Mm -hmm. And you know how sometimes you use a tool and then you graduate and you don't need it anymore? Yeah. <laughs> so this is subliminal messaging, meaning the words should not be audible. Mm -hmm. And this is right after I, I released the majority of victimhood patterns. I could suddenly hear clearly every word that was being said in that track. Nice. And even though I had played it on repeat probably 100,000 times up to that point over the years, it's like something just clicked and I don't need that track anymore. Mm -hmm. So yay. Beautiful. But I, I think, I think, yeah. But what I used to do for off days is I used to play subliminal optimism uh, and just loop it. So like the subliminal messaging of that stuff would get in. But yeah, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I was going to do the dance. I like dance these days, go out and ecstatic dance. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I could. <laughs> Break dancing. <laughs> Michael Jackson, baby. <laughs> David, you're going to say something or should we uh, what's that? It's a really terrible was, job that uh, you'd have to dye your skin for that one. <laughs> yeah, you were literally like covering your mouth and like, yeah. say it or not? He's like, um. <laughs> I have a friend who um, enjoys triggering people and he enjoys when people unfriend and unfollow him when he, he uh, stands in his authentic truth and it's very strong and he's you know, he really embodies badassery. And we both posted something the other week about like so many people are so easily offended. Um, mm -hmm. Why do they choose to be wounded? And I think that's, that's like a thin line of, you know, 
who do you want your audience to be and, and all that other stuff. But um, no, I didn't have anything else right away. I, I have a few more minutes though. What time is it? It's uh, we're 5.45. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how people can find you. It's actually 5.42, not 5.45. But maybe you can tell us uh, what, uh, how people can find you, our website, all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. So my website is magicalgoldenage.com. Mm -hmm. um, and you can throw all this stuff in the description of the video, right? Yeah. Sweet. Uh, my Instagram is at Sorcerer David. Um, mm -hmm. My Facebook is uh, david.magic.salomon. Mm -hmm. uh, my book is Magic is Real. My, what else do I have that's out there? I have a TikTok, but I'm going to probably reboot it, but it's Sorcerer David as well. Um, and yeah, I think those are like the pretty, the pretty major ones. Um, oh yeah, YouTube is youtube.com slash magic is real as well. And um, yeah, I, I, people reach out all the time for different reasons. I love this work. I love serving. It's a lot of fun. It's very mm -hmm. nourishing and fulfilling. And um, yeah, much more to come. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, because when things start opening up, probably we, uh, you know, we, uh, you get to do, or we get to do more workshops and in-person stuff. So that'll be. Well, I think we can do those on online and then shift it to in-person yeah. and not wait for an yeah. undetermined and possibly changeable date. So as if anybody wants <laughs> to be in like a group mastermind of yeah. have, having a supportive mm -hmm. community, learning, growing, practicing together, yeah. having shared intentions, amplifying magical power, totally hit me up because I want to start one of those as soon as we have 13 people. Oh, 13. Lucky number, I guess. Uh, yeah. in, in, in India, it's considered unlucky. I don't know here. Is it in considered unlucky everywhere again well technically i would be the 14th one and that's seven <laughs> times two and that's two divinities or divine balancing of masculine and feminine so <laughs> yeah i was actually divine masculine and feminine is something i wanted to start off with while i was walking i'm like maybe that would be a good place to start but maybe next time so maybe if you I think next time we could totally yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So if you yeah, hey, yeah, everyone but, watching, if you if you want us to be on another one, please comment, please ask questions, please like, subscribe, share, <laughs> engage. And if this gets a lot of traction, especially more then we'll definitely do a series. Sounds good. Daitina, you want to uh, end with any kind of message or anything? I don't think so. Just thank you guys. This was a lot of fun. All right. Thank thanks, you, David. Now. Thanks, Tatina. Thanks, Tim. We'll talk again soon. And thanks, everybody. For <laughs> that was cool. I know. I know. We had to, just, we had to come up with something. <laughs> like, just magic. Oh, yeah. Here. <laughs> yeah. Dance. Oh, really Dance. Here. <laughs> I know. Seriously, uh, I, could, I would totally video effects. You could totally do everything. You'd have dinosaurs coming in or flowers blooming into chipmunks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, have fun. Have a great evening. You too. Ciao. Bye, guys. Ciao. Bye. <laughs>